uh, welcome Marty McIntyre, the executive director of. Uh, I have a new name. <laughs> they have a new name, Fresh Yoga. Uh, the, the yes. They used to be the uh, pre cast, pre stress, uh, concrete uh, producers for Wisconsin and Illinois. This is a big name, and she has a big position, but she has a sweetheart and sweet spirit. She came all the way from Chicago to be with us. She injured her foot, but uh, she's yeah. walking yes. well. Uh, <laughs> I am walking, thank so you that's an improvement for, for and, uh, six months ago. Please, uh, so, thank you. Um, I will give you all the information. I know you need that. Um, he, Dr. Wabi asks for reports, so I'll give you my name and everything again in a, in a slide. Um, I came today to talk to you about um, precast and pre-stressed concrete and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what the different products are, how they all work together, what are some of the construction issues that uh, you know our members look at and that uh, come in the erection of a, a building and a little bit about color and texture and how you can make it look nice and the things that architects probably care about more than than you do. But just to get started, I thought I'd show you a, a little eight minute um, video. And this just goes through a lot of the history of our industry and uh, what all of the different products are. So it's um, a nice video that they did for the 50th anniversary of the association. And um, let me start that. Doing anything? There. Okay. Yeah, there's no. Ah, okay. Can we start this? Ah, there we go. Changes of the past 50 years. Sound is good in the back. You can be still if you like. I, I, they didn't really miss anything. They'd like to see this. You want to see it again? Never imagine the changes I, we've seen in our own industry. The innovations in architecture, construction, and building materials. When Gustav Moniel designed the Walnut Lane Memorial Bridge in 1950, who could have conceived that an entirely new industry would take shape based on applications for precast concrete? When the Precast Pre-Stress Concrete Institute was formed 50 years ago in 1954, we imagined a future when precast pre-stress concrete would be one of the world's most widely used building materials. That future is now. Today, as always, PCI continues to work closely with producers, suppliers, and professionals to develop new techniques, certify precast's quality, and educate the industry about precast concrete's advantages for today's construction team. During the recent AIA convention, designers reflected on precast's past, present, and future. Right now, this is this you know precast is is back into the market uh, very strongly with the, the jump in steel pricing. Everybody's looking to precast and speed. Speed is what this whole thing is about. Everybody wants that product fast and delivered. Precast's speed of construction is a key benefit designers appreciate. I use precast on projects because uh, of cost and and uh, a lot of times because the schedule it needs to go quick and uh, precast is a good way. To, you know, reducing your schedule. Precast's quality is widely acknowledged. Uh, the things we look at in the exterior skin systems we evaluate with our owners and our architectural partners is one, the quality of the product. Two, is it a cost-effective solution to the overall uh, building? And what we found is most recently is Precast is a, is a great solution, especially as we're comparing it to other products such as a granite material or a, what we call a GFRC glass fiber reinforced concrete. The more that you can do in, in plant or off site and ring on site, I think the quality is going to be a lot better. And also with materials waste, um, that can be managed as well. Precast's quality and durability are key benefits to owners and architects. Well, there are benefits of time, constructability, benefits in certain climates for certain types of uses. I believe it is a very flexible material. It's an inherent uh, thermal performance and you know with correct detail and good durability and, and really it's an ability to be formed into a wonderful three-dimensional shape. As new ideas take shape, still more are in the imaginations of designers and producers waiting to be brought to life. 
the technology that today is available using 3D modeling and using more than actually 3D modeling, I would like to refer to it as 4D modeling, and the fact that that encompasses the entire building integration modeling. It refers to the fact that we now have an ability to integrate all aspects of the trades and the specialties that work in creating a building in a single cycle, in a type of technology that allows it to integrate seamlessly among itself, will provide tremendous advantages to the precast industry. In the future, more commercial structures will be framed with complete precast systems, using the various repetitive components created by precasting techniques. Today's all precast designs consist of precast columns, beams, floor members, exterior finished members, and stair and elevator shafts. This approach can create structural components with architectural finishes, reducing piece counts and saving materials. Building height won't be restrained by total precast systems, as even 50-story buildings can be easily designed. It's a very innovative moment in all construction. We're seeing a proliferation of new building systems and materials, things that we've really never imagined before. So we're seeing a boom in tall buildings all over the world. Uh, at the same time, that we're seeing advances in all types of building systems and materials. Buildings now feature precast concrete panels with glazing and window openings and even stud backups applied to the plant. More complex finishes are being used on architectural panels, surpassing the traditional finishes that designers expect. Custom form liners, heavier textures, multicolored panels, and intricate designs are becoming popular. I love the, the material. You can do anything with concrete uh, and get it to span, support, um, and accept load in any shape or fashion. <coughs> the behavior of the material, although it's non-linear, it is. It is a very easy material to design, uh, very easy material to produce, uh, and the end result are beautiful buildings. The advances being made today in seismic connections will continue, producing techniques that create safe, cost-effective designs in every seismic zone. Ultra-high performance concrete is expanding the durability of precast concrete to 30,000 PSI and beyond. New performance characteristics for concrete mix designs are creating higher strengths, faster production, and better aesthetics for all types of projects. Precast, pre-stressed components are being used for more bridge pieces, including beams, deck slabs, pier caps, and columns. Precast can greatly speed bridge replacement and initial construction. The fact that today we are able to push the length of the spans well beyond anything that we ever considered to do in the past by using splice girder design, it is a tremendous advantage to the precast industry. We virtually have now an ability to play, in essence, in a market that we have never been able to play in the past. New strands, such as carbon fiber reinforced polymers, are replacing steel and producing more durable, higher strength components. We see advances, for instance, uh, with new carbon fiber technology that allows composite products that are twice as strong the steel. In concrete, we see mixtures, fibers, for instance, added to the basic product that make a lightweight product that is stronger than <coughs> its heavier original. New standards are being promoted by Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, an initiative of the U.S. Green Building Council. The result? A growing interest in sustainable design boosting precast's potential even further. I see green building becoming the next wave of manufacturing and using materials that are economically safe. And, um, they don't create harmful environment, environmental problems if you would. It gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of the aesthetic component of our projects and it also lets us move ahead our agenda to increase the sustainable design content of all our projects. In the 21st century, PCI will continue working closely with educators to ensure that bright young designers and innovators continue to join our industry eager to tackle tomorrow's challenges. I've been teaching for 30 years. I've been teaching a course that deals with architectural precast and structural precast for those 30 years. And PCI has been a big part of really uh, getting me the materials, the books that our students use in my classes. 
These students, along with today's designers and producers, will benefit from the market's new technologies. Think in the past of stick-built construction, where numerous people were employed in literally hammering together the thousands of components that made a building. And think how we can improve that process. One way is thinking of the assembly of buildings by component, by large panel, if you will, and making those panels smarter, controlling their quality, and literally being able to bolt together large, effective, well-designed pieces. That would take less time to construct, less time to assemble, and actually we think we're able to get greater quality by controlling the manufacturing process of component assembly off-site. Computer-aided programs offer great potential to promote interoperability and reduce errors throughout the design and construction process. There are four major advantages to using 3D modeling. Number one is reduction of time to production. The second advantage is the ability to reduce the engineering and design operations. The third advantage is to have an ability to reduce the actual drawing production efforts. And the last advantage, but definitely not the least, is the ability to have a collaborative effort in which everybody participates in creating a building model. You are able to present it to your client in a very fast and, and productive way, and they have an ability to decide that precast is their choice. Bridge designs can also benefit. The dynamics of the bridge industry are very well in tune for using this type of technology. On the bridge industry, we have many more standardized cross-sections. We have much more standardized design and construction processes. We have a government agency that ensures, in essence, that the development, design, production, and building of bridges, it is done to very rigorous specifications, which are more uniform across the country. All those parameters allow 3D modeling to be very well fitted for this type of design. The basics of these systems can be adapted to create new techniques and additional technologies for a more controlled construction experience. We're starting to evaluate RFIDs, or, or technologies that can track pieces in the yard electronically. We're using GPS, or where they sit on the buildings. We're tracking trailers as they come and go out of the yard. So the industry itself is really becoming proactive at using technology that are in other industries and really turning our industry into more of a streamlined, flow, lean type of manufacturing environment, which it never had before. The future <laughs> promises many surprises and dramatic improvements. I really see in the future an ability to have an architect communicating with a producer, with a designer and an engineer on the web, models being posted, multiple people talking and having conference calls while they're looking at the same model of a building. An ability that will give us a tremendous potential to increase the level of production of precast buildings in this country. A great future. It's not surprising given the pioneering work and breathtaking innovations of the first 50 years. Uh, 50 years is not such a long time in architecture. You know, uh, you look at the Roman baths and the Parthenon, you're looking at 2,500 years of construction durability and, and certainly pre-stressed concrete is right there in line with all that masonry and concrete construction from ancient Roman times. So uh, what, are, what are we going to think about what we're doing today 2,500 years from now is what I'd like to know. PCI will continue to blend today's solutions with tomorrow's possibilities, always encouraging, nurturing, strengthening, and promoting our industry, our products, and our people. The dream continues. Truly, the best is yet to come. Well, the video is a couple years old, but I think it does a nice job of um, explaining kind of the history of our industry and, and a little bit about what we hope the future is holding. Um, most of the precast manufacturers are just that, they're manufacturers and then they're supplying construction products and it's re it really is a just-in-time industry. Um, they truck it to the job site, get it there, you have the erector ready to put it up on the building and then the truck leaves. So um, they, they really 
don't require too much space right on the job site. They come right in, get it on the building, and get it out. Before I get into my PowerPoint presentation, I also wanted to show you um, this. Uh, can I back this up? Let's see if I can figure this out. Let's see if I can start it. Here it is. Whoa. All right. Okay, we don't need the music quite that loud. Um, this is a, a 3D animation that um, one of the members of the, um, on the East Coast did. And this is um, what in the industry we often call total precast construction or a precast structure and frame. And it really shows you all of the different types of precast products that are available for buildings. This doesn't include the bridges. You see the um, columns and beams going in, the spandrel panels. In this case, they're putting in um, double T's. But in this part of the country, we mainly have seen this kind of construction for mid-rise buildings, um, seven to nine stories, and they mostly have been condominiums that use hollow core. Um, the elevator shafts and stairwells are um, also precast. And um, one of the really, uh, the real advantages of this kind of construction over other typical uh, types of construction is the speed that you can erect it with. You see here, a minute and a half, you have a whole building. It was a joke. Okay. You guys got to wake up a little bit. No, it takes, we had uh, one member did an eight-story building, and they did 80 days of erection time on it. So it, uh, it can go up, basically it was a story a week that, uh, that went up on it. It was pretty, pretty fast. Here's the HVAC hanging right off of it. Um, and then you also have your um, stairs can be precast as well. Um, it's very quick to just enclose the whole building and get the trades inside and working very quickly. So this would be a typical office building. Uh, it's a very regional type of construction. In uh, Colorado, we see almost all the office buildings being built using this type of construction. In Chicago, we're seeing uh, an occasional condominium using it. Um, and also in, up in Milwaukee, we, we've seen it. On the East Coast, uh, we're seeing a lot of condominiums and office buildings both coming in and using that type of construction. So it's, uh, it's very regional. And there are several things about the industry that are, are kind of regional anomalies that uh, we'll talk about as we go on today. Anybody have any questions about how that went together? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, usually they have welded connections, and so they're bolted and then welded um, together. Um, usually the columns can be um, 20 uh, feet about, and then they're, they've got welded connections. Let me get into my PowerPoint. Oh, it's already open here. This is who I am. I know that you need this information <laughs> for your report. And um, our group now is called PCI of Illinois and Wisconsin. Uh, we were formerly the precast pre-stress producers of Illinois and Wisconsin. But we're the regional affiliate of um, the precast pre-stress concrete institute, PCI. And um, you'll get uh, more information about PCI. You'll get some books from them, I think, later in the semester. And uh, they are the national trade group. Um, are you guys at all familiar with what trade groups are and trade industries? Let me talk a little bit about, about that. Basically, our <coughs> association um, has member companies. And we have 13 member companies who ship their product into Illinois and Wisconsin. And they've all banded together, and they hired me as their uh, marketing and executive um, to run the association to do a lot of education events. Some trade associations do lobbying. We do a little bit of that in government relations. Um, and uh, a lot of uh, ind industry education as well. I, d I do. Um, uh, education for the, the precasters in our area as well. And then we all support the National Trade Association. So if you're familiar with um, CSI, 
the Construction Specifications Institute, the American Institute of Architects. Um, those are all um, organizations that are similar to ours that are in the construction industry. So these are who my member companies are. Um, I thought I would get started today by talking about all of the different products. We kind of saw them all fly in together and, and go together very quickly in a building. One of the most common types of products that you're going to see, especially in this area because there's a number of manufacturers doing it, is hollow core. Um, hollow core are these um, floor panels, or they can be roof panels. They come in widths of 2 feet, 4 feet, and 8 feet, and are typically about 30 feet long. Um, different manufacturers manufacture them in different ways. Um, what you see right down here is called the wet cast process, and that's um, uh, uh, Flexicore is the name, uh, the trade brand of it. Flexicore is two feet wide, and they use a wet cast process where the concrete goes in, um, is pretty wet as it goes in, and then it kind of wraps around those pneumatic tubes that you see in there, and that's what creates the, the hollow cores in there. Um, there's also a dry cast method, um, like you see here, and that's usually either four feet or eight feet wide, and that is going to be extruded out. That concrete is so dry that the minute it comes out of the machine, you can just walk right on it. So it's a, it's a very dry method. And then they've got um, pieces in the extrusion machine that core the hollow uh, cores through it. Um, anybody have any ideas of why you would have hollow cores in the floor panels? Somebody said wait. Did you say wait? Yeah, that's it, exactly. Concrete is a very heavy product and you don't need uh, the strength of that concrete in, in uh, all of the locations. You've got the steel going in there too and so you want to make it a little bit lighter weight. Shipping, um, erecting it on the building, um, just the loads in place. Yeah? Um, as, as far as manufacturing? Yeah. Um, I don't know. That's a, good, that's a good question. No one's ever asked me uh, which is cheaper. Um, you know, basically each job is going to be individually bid for um, each particular project. And so um, sometimes it works better. Like one of our um, manufacturers does both types of methods. Yeah. So what, do you have to have a finisher finish all that or no? No. Normally um, they'll just screed off the top of it and then as they put it in place, You'll usually put about a two-inch layer of uh, concrete over the top for the floor mix. And that's um, be not only because of the, the finish on top, um, and you'll have a lot of, um, uh, you know, gaps, not gaps, but uh, where the pieces meet. So you want to straighten that out. <clears throat> But uh, also because of the pre-stressing process, you'll have an arch or a camber, and so you want to make sure that you have a level surface because of that. Any other questions about hollow core? Okay. Um, oh, here's this. Uh, double T's are the other floor product you're going to see. If you've ever been in a precast parking deck before, you're sure to have seen uh, double T's. Anybody know why they might be called double T's? They look like two T's. <laughs> it's not too early in the morning for you guys. They look like two T's right next to each other. There's also single T's, but we don't really see m much of those used anymore. Those were used more like 20 years ago. Um, so parking decks, gymnasiums, um, industrial buildings. Typically, you're going to see about a 60-foot roof span, or excuse me, a 60-foot floor span with those, say, in a parking deck. Um, if you have a roof span, you might see as much as 100 feet with it. The trick when you get a 100-foot roof span with a double T is then how do you get it to the job site? And uh, the precasters have to get special permitting for that normally. You're usually not going to do that in a really urban area. Um, that's been done in more like suburban areas and uh, out in exurban areas. So, um, double T's are uh, pretty typical. Now I should have. All right, I'll just keep using this. Um, insulated wall panels. Um, 
one of the things that you can get with concrete is great thermal mass, but you don't get much in terms of R value. The R value that you're going to get from the walls is going to come from whatever insulation you use. So a lot of times in um, gymnasiums or um, prisons or industrial buildings, they'll add the insulation inside the sandwich of the wall panel. So you'll usually get what's called a 323 panel. It'll have three inches of concrete on an interior wythe, two inches of insulation, and then another three inches of concrete on an exterior wythe. Then those two wythes have to be joined together somehow. So that can be done either by um, creating gaps in the insulation where the concrete will go all the way through, or there's also some um, products that Dow and some other companies manufacture that act as connectors for um, those two whites of concrete. Um, uh, pretty, pretty typical um, application for industrial or schools, things like that. Modular construction is something that we typically see only in the prison market. Occasionally you'll see it in the um, education market or hotels, things like that. But in Illinois, we really have only seen it in the prison market. Almost all the prisons being built now use modular gel cells that are precast. Um, they're precast, they're usually not pre-stressed, so they just have your typical reinforcing in there with uh, uh, wire mesh and uh, rebar cages things like that. What you see here are two jail cells, one right next to each other. It's a five-sided piece of um, precast and then at the precaster site they can put in the plumbing, they can put in uh, the electrical boxes, they can um, the, put in the doors and security systems all off-site. Um, we had the uh, director of uh, prison construction in Illinois come talk to our group and one of the things that he was saying is all of the job sites for prisons have to be secure. So every time a worker comes on at the beginning of the day and then leaves at the end of the day, that was adding about 45 minutes of time to their, to their job that they're paying these guys for. So they like to have as much work as possible done off-site and brought onto the job site. So that's one of the reasons that Illinois is using all this uh, precast modular construction for their prisons, although there's not a whole lot of construction going on in this area right now. Then the roof up here is used as the floor of the, um, the uh, module, modular piece stacked on top of it. And you see there's kind of a lip sticking out. Um, that's going to be a walkway then around it. So then they just stack one right on top of the other going up. Um, one of the things that you're going to see on Wednesday when you go to County Materials are the bridge products that they manufacture. Most of the time in Illinois um, and other parts of the country, precasters are going to specialize in one area or the other. Part of that is because uh, bridge products really require a lot of cooperation with the state DOT and other um, county engineers and, and the people who are generally building the bridges. So um, most of the time you'll see somebody, if they're doing bridge beams, that's all they're doing, although that's not always the case. One of our members does a little <coughs> bit of uh, a lot of things. Um, what you see up on top is a box beam, and uh, in the middle is actually um, a cardboard piece, so it's, there's a large void in the middle of it, so it's not concrete all of the way through. Um, down on the bottom is an I-beam, and uh, that's typical for a little bit longer spans than, uh, than you would see with the box beam. Um, also, um, you're going to see structural products like the inverted T, the ledger beam, um, other types of products that can be used to create um, that piece that we just saw all flying in together. So um, there are a lot of uh, structural products out there as well. Um, most of the hollow core producers in this area also produce these structural products and they are the ones doing most of the um, uh, total precast construction. So that's kind of all of the different products. Does anybody have any questions about those products? Usually there are um, about three stories. Yeah. 
they can they can prefab them, but um, depending on the size of them, if they're more than four inches, they'll probably prefab them. If they're smaller than that, they'll probably drill them. Any other questions? I thought I would kind of take you on a little nickel tour of a precasting plant so you can see what it looks like. And we're also going to talk a little bit about pre-stressing at the same time and um, why you pre-stress concrete and, and how, how does it actually um, happen in the plant. Um, first of all, it's important to know that there are several different types of, of precast. But most of the precasters are all members of the PCI, the Precast Pre-Stress Concrete Institute. To be a member of PCI, they have to be PCI certified. That means that it's uh, an inspector comes to their plant twice a year, makes an unannounced visit, and spends two days auditing the plant for about 175 different items. Things from how do you store your materials, what kinds of records do you keep, uh, where, what kind of quality control do you do, where are you keeping your... Um, your cylinders for the concrete that you're testing, is all of your equipment in working order. So all of those things are things that the um, inspector looks for. That uh, PCI certification is, I used to say like the USDA stamp of approval, but then somebody said, well, you, know, you can't trust the government. So uh, maybe more like the UL laboratories or the Better Homes and Gardens, you know, seal of approval. Um, on your, your concrete. So it is something to look for. In this part of the country, most of the precasters are PCI certified, so it's not really a problem. Once you know that they're PCI certified, you can look up and see what kinds of products they're certified to do. Bridge producers have to be separately certified because there are certain issues with the loads involved in, in bridges and the quality of the concrete and the durability standards that you need to meet that uh, bridge producers are specifically uh, interested in. Um, then you have your standard products, and those are going to be things that are cast in what are, in our industry we call long line beds. And you're going to see that on, um, on Wednesday when you see um, County Materials. They've changed their name, so I'm stumbling over the name of their company. When you go to County Materials, they're casting all of their bridge products in these long line beds. And that means that they're made out of steel and they're casting multiple pieces at the same time. So they'll all go on the bed at the same time, come off the next morning at the, at the same time. Then you'll also see your specialty pieces. And then when you go up to um, Lombard Architectural up in Chicago, <coughs> up in Alsip, you're going to see more specialty pieces. Although he does have the capability in that particular plant of doing long line casting, most of what uh, Lombard is doing are these specialty pieces. So there's more color and texture. And most of the forms are built out of plywood rather than out of steel. They'll probably use those forms 25 to 35 times, depending on um, what they're looking for in that product. And then they'll recycle them. But uh, they'll be specially built for that uh, particular product and more one of a kind, more specialty, and therefore usually a little more expensive. All concrete has to have some kind of reinforcing in it. Um, and all of the, whether it's precast or pre-stressed, you're always going to see some kind of mild reinforcing. And that's going to include your wire mesh, your rebar. Once in a while, you'll see um, fibers being used to reinforce, but to not, not too often. There's some new reinforcement um, with carbon fiber. Um, where they're using some carbon fiber grids that are being um, used in the panels and then they're having um, wall panels that are just as strong as six or eight inch thick panels but they're only about two inches thick so that carbon fiber is pretty interesting. Um, post tensioning, this is one of those regional anomalies that we were talking about. We don't see a whole lot of post tensioning in the Midwest. You'll occasionally see it for a bridge or a parking deck, but in general, we don't see a whole lot of it. If you were to see post-tensioning, the precaster would create a sleeve within the product, then it would go out to the job site, the steel would go into that sleeve at the job site, it would get tension there, and then um, grout it into place, so you would see it that way. Most of the time, if you need extra strength with precast products, what you're going to see is pre-stressing rather than post-tensioning. 
Pre-stressing takes all of the best qualities of a very durable, high strength concrete and combines it with high strength steel. So you've got concrete that's going to be good in compression and um, uh, tension. Um, so what it's going to create is something with this arch or a camber. We're going to kind of go through the, the manufacturing process to look at how that happens. This is a typical wall panel plant. And you see the long line beds that I was talking about. They're steel. They're built up a little bit because underneath they do have heating elements. They want to always control the temperature. One of the things that a precaster wants to do is he wants to turn his product over every day. So he's creating new product and getting it out of the plant every day. They do that a couple different ways. One is by controlling the temperature that they have. Another is by using a very low water cement ratio concrete. That means that there's more cement in the concrete that they use and so the hydration happens faster. You see here they're putting in um, some wire mesh and then they're also putting in bu door bucks and windows. And then there's um, pieces in between each of the pieces of concrete. So they're casting multiple panels all at the same time on the same bed. This is actually Lombard, where we're going to be. You won't see this particular form, because this is from a job about a year and a half ago. But you can see the difference here in the types of form work that they have right away. This looks like a skate park. It's got that radius construction on it. It's um, got a lot of wood. The carpenters really work very hard. And it's all very individual, um, very unusual pieces. So that's more typical of the um, architectural type of precasting. Back to the wall panels where we're looking at it in the steel plants. You see here that they've got their, um, they've got their wire mesh. And then right here, they've got their pre-stressing steel. All the pre-stressing for each of the panels that they're casting in that long line bed has to be the same because it's stressed on either end of the, um, of the bed. So that's one of the reasons that when you're designing and precast, you want to create a lot of repetition because you want to create panels that use all of the same uh, placement of the reinforcing steel. I brought along a sample of uh, the steel that you're typically going to see in a uh, precast plant. It's called a seven wire strand. It's a little bit different than what you would normally see with rebar because it actually has the ability to stretch and give a little bit. So if any of you can put about 35, 40,000 psi of pressure on this, you'll actually be able to stretch it. But it functions almost like a steel rubber band. It's called a seven wire strand because there's one piece of strand going through the middle and then six pieces of strand wrapped around it. So, and then if anybody's asleep, you can just poke them with it. So, yeah, you can, you can take off the end of it if you want to see what the strand looks like in there. So they put that strand in place and then they're going to um, tension it. And this is at, uh, this might even be at County Materials. I can't remember which bridge producer I took this at. This is the end of a box beam form. You can see there's quite a bit more pre-stressing strand here than if we go back to the wall panel than you'd see here. And because, that's because there's going to be far more load placed on this than you'd, than you'd see in a wall panel. Um, one of the other things that you see is on the end of each of these, there's what's called a strand chuck. They're going to come and uh, get, get the forms all ready, and then they're going to put that 35 or 40,000 psi of pressure on it. And they'll use one of these strand chucks. It's got a little O-ring in here that's got little teeth that will actually hold that strand with all of that pressure while the concrete is curing. So you can kind of see what that looks like. And you'll see in the plants that they're all just as clean as this one is. So it does get used quite a bit. But they do have to keep them up and, and keep them oiled and cleaned and ready to go. So then they, they stress the strand. And that's actually the most dangerous part of the, um, of the manufacturing process. Um, if one of those, uh, occasionally in a, a plant, one of those strands will um, snap 
give way and then it usually will come back. So um, as you're touring through the plants, if you see any flashing lights and people standing behind big uh, wire mesh cages, you don't want to stand on um, either side or behind that, that uh, bed. You always want to stand away from it. Uh, it's not like it always happens, it just is one of the safety precautions. One of the other things that um, to keep in mind as you're going through the plants on Wednesday, you do want to wear hard-toed shoes, so you don't want to have any flip-flops or sandals or you probably guys aren't going to wear high heels, but I've seen architects come in with high heels and you don't want to wear those either. Um, so they've got the pre-stressing in place and then they're going to place the concrete in the form. Most of the precasters are now using self-compacting or self-consolidating concrete. Are you guys familiar with that at all? Let's talk a little bit about that so you'll know what you're seeing. Um, as you're seeing, these, um, <coughs> the concrete mixes go in, the forms, a lot of times now, they just can stop the mixer or stop the bucket place the concrete in the form and then it will actually level itself through the whole form and not require any vibration. A lot of the precasters are using an admixture that uh, really does a good job of helping the cement coat all of the different aggregate in the mix and that means that uh, it's a little soupier and it also flows a lot better. Yeah. Right, yeah, it, it is being, it's not like it's only being used in, um, in precast yeah. plants, it's but it is more expensive uh, for the product, but the precasters like it because they save a lot on labor, because they don't have the guys there with the vibrators going along. Now, you're not going to see that in any of the um, DOT projects that require pre-stressing, because the DOT isn't allowing it in pre-stressed products yet, but they're they're finalizing an agreement to start to use that in the pre-stress products as well. So that's one of the changes that we're starting to see. Um, so self-compacting concrete, the architects like it a lot because it looks pretty, it's smooth, it's got a nice finish without a lot of bug holes or chips or dings. Precasters like it because they don't have to pay as much in labor costs. After the concrete is placed in, it's going to be um, uh, cured. And uh, we have outdoor plants in a lot of parts of the country. Um, you're going to see County Materials is an outdoor plant for all of their bridge products. Um, Lombard is an indoor pro uh, company with all of the architectural products. Um, this would be a, a large uh, bridge beam being cured, and you can see that they've, they've got a blanket over it. They're steam curing it. So even though it's outdoors, and even though they, they manufacture it year-round, they still control the temperature of those beds. So it still is all um, quality controlled and, um, and keep the temperature even, and that also helps speed the process as they come along. That, Well, the, the, yeah, the, it's not even 24 hours, it's overnight, so sometimes it's 12 hours strengths. They're looking at about 3,500 PSI, and uh, they're usually looking um, at 28 day strengths of 7,500 PSI and, and up. Usually it's even higher than that, usually more like 10,000 PSI and up. But they're designing it for strengths of about 7,500. So they come in the next morning and check and make sure everything's in place. They um, look to make sure the concrete has reached that 3,500 PSI and then they're ready to cut the strand. Now when we looked at the strand earlier we were talking about how it's like a steel rubber band and the strand in precast is always if you're if you've got a beam like this where where do you think in the beam the the strand will be placed? Any any idea? It's always going to be placed in the bottom of the strand and that's what's going to help create this arch or this camber. If you see what's on top, that would be a, pre, a, a beam with no um, pre-stressing in it. So the weight of the concrete would actually create a load that would create this 
This is supposed to be minor stress cracking. It always cracks me up when I see this slide. If you ever see minor cracking that looks like this, run for the hills, don't go anywhere near it. But this is supposed to represent minor stress cracking. So you would see that on a beam without the pre-stressing in it. If you do have the pre-stressing, it would look like this because you've placed your pre-stressing in the bottom of the form. The precaster comes in and as the concrete cures overnight, it actually will adhere to that steel that's being stressed at 35 or 40,000 PSI. So when the precaster comes in the next morning, they'll cut both ends of that strand. Well, it's being stretched like a rubber band and it's cure, the concrete has cured and snapped around it, so it wants to snap back into place. Well, because the concrete's cured to it, it can't, and so instead it tensions all of that concrete and you get this arch or camber. As you're going through the plants on Wednesday, you'll actually be able to see this in the bridge beams. It's actually visible to the naked eye, so it's, uh, it's pretty interesting to see. Now, as you're, uh, when the engineers are designing the precast, they can't actually design the camber. Um, they can approximate what the camber will be, but they actually design it for the loads that are going to be on it, and that is going to create the camber. That's kind of a nickel tour through the manufacturing process. Does anybody have any questions about that? I thought I would take you through some of the, uh, I thought I got rid of this, um, okay, let's go back. I thought I would take you through some of the different um, details that you can get with, with precast and some of the trends that we're seeing. One is the sculptural shapes. We're really starting to see precasters being pushed more to do 3D sculptural shapes. And actually one of my members just did a project called um, Varsity Village at the University of uh, Cincinnati. And um, they had uh, 3D modeling used for all of the precast components on the exterior section. He did not have any right angles on the entire precast uh, portion of the project. So it was pretty challenging to, to do that. And we're starting to see more um, architects and designers look for unusual shapes and, and sculptural pieces out of the precast. We're also seeing a lot of details being used. Um, in, this is a hospital up in the Chicago um, area called Condell Medical Center. And um, this attention to detail with all of the different motifs is something that we're starting to see quite a bit on the products. We're also um, seeing a lot of color being used, more so than it was 10 years ago. Um, in this case, this is stained. Um, Concrete producers who do wall panels generally don't include the stain as part of their contract. <coughs> the stains are usually part of the, uh, uh, done at the job site and are part of the contractor's subs, but not part of the precast contract. Um, security is an issue. Um, there's a new FBI building in Chicago that was built using precast concrete, and the U.S. Air Force is doing some blast resistant design testing with precast. So um, we are seeing more and more people looking for ways of building um, secure buildings, whether it be for um, floods or hurricanes or attack. Early consultation is a trend that my members really like to see. They're, they're starting to get involved in projects, um, usually in the schematic design phase is when they like to get involved, when they can talk to the architect and say, yes, this will make a good precast project, or no, it's, it's not an ideal project for um, precast. This is Soldier Field. And it really represents uh, the speed of design and construction in, in a lot of ways, and the teamwork that uh, people are looking for on some of these bigger projects. Um, it was pretty interesting to erect because um, you could only erect it from inside the bowl of the, um, of the field. You couldn't do anything from around. There was a roadside on one area, and then there were park, parking decks on either side. So they really were limited. So the cranes were quite challenging on this project. Um, the precaster worked with the team and came up with some solutions for some lightweight concrete on some of the larger pieces of the precast on the top of the bowl because the crane just wasn't able to have that reach 
with some of the heavier pieces of concrete. They also had to do some uh, finagling with the steel erectors. The steel erectors actually came in, used the cranes during the daylight hours, so from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., the, the uh, steel erectors came in, and then the precast erectors came in, and I don't know how they drew the short end of the stick, but they got to erect precast all night. So they actually had 24-hour erection going on. Um, in the in the project so you know typically this would have been a 24 month schedule um, with the parking decks and the the stadium but because of the uh, Bears playing schedule they had to finish it in 18 months and they did it the pre uh, the uh, contractor would have been f fill, uh, fined I guess five million dollars for any games that the Bears were going to miss at the stadium so they had real incentive to get it done on time um, the other portions of this that were precast were the parking decks and they're pretty interesting parking decks as well because they've got large planters on the top of it that actually have trees inside the planters and then part of the parking deck is underground so the loads and oh and the soldier field rests on top of one of the parking decks too so the loads that they were taking were not typical parking deck loads and it was a pretty interesting project so they were originally designed as cast in place but uh, cast in place couldn't meet the um, design schedule or the construction schedule. So it was a pretty interesting project as far as the speed of construction and the way that the, the group had to really function as a team to get it done in time. Um, just a little bit about uh, finishes and colors. There are a lot of um, possibilities out there when you're talking about architectural precast and how are you going to finish a building and what is it going to look like. Um, one of the things that you'll see at the architectural plant is that um, you can finish it, finish the surface of a precast product in different ways and get very different looks. This is actually an example of just a 12 inch by 12 inch sample of concrete and it's been finished in three different ways. On the far side is an acid etch finish and that uses a muriatic acid and a hot water wash and it just removes the finest particles of the concrete to give you kind of a smooth limestone-like finish. In the center, they've sandblasted it, so you get that kind of white halo effect. And they've also gone a little bit deeper, so you can see more of the aggregate. Uh, in the section here, you've got a chemical retarder that's actually a sugar-based retarder that stops the concrete from curing on the surface. So you um, stop the concrete from curing, you then use a high pressure water wash and you can expose a lot of the aggregate that way. So you really can get very different looks. It's all the exact same mix of concrete. What's, what they've changed is the way they finished it. The uh, costs for finishing different in one or the other? Uh, yes, and it's all going <laughs> to vary on the project and how many pieces you're finishing that way and uh, the sizes of the panels and how many panels you have to move in the yard and things like that. But um, also, you know, some of the precasters do more acid etching than um, sandblasting. And those really cost about the same. Um, chemical retarders can cost a little bit more than those. Yeah? Do you wait until it dries all the way before you do that? Um, typically, yeah, you'll do it. You'll, you'll cure it overnight, take it out. It might sit in the yard for a day or two and then they'll go ahead and finish it that way. So it, it's not like they're waiting weeks and weeks, but sometimes they'll let it cure a couple days. Any other questions? Um, one of the things that um, we've seen a lot of lately are these um, insulated wall panels where they're adding um, insulation. And you can see this is a Dow system where they've got these uh, connectors um, that are done out of a composite material. Sometimes you'll also see connectors done out of uh, steel, um, but uh, those will carry the cold temperature through. So a lot of the, the people who are really concerned about the thermal mass and not having cold spots in a wall panel will use something more like this. It is possible now to have um, uh, insulation from top to bottom and side to side in a project. Um, precast connections, just talk about the when you're connecting wall panels you really are going to have two basic types of uh, connections. Um, one is your gravity connector 
and that's going to be what defies gravity and holds it up on the wall. Um, gravity connectors are you're going to have at least one. You might have two, but you'll never have more than two because you can't predict the loads um, if you have more than two. So um, those are going to be on the um, wall panel uh, where they need to connect to the structure. So it's going to change in every wall panel. The, um, the gravity connectors will be in a different place. Um, then the wall panels will also have tieback connections. And uh, the tieback connections, you're always going to have a minimum of four connections, and then sometimes you'll also have six connections. I need a brighter location, but you've got them located on the corners here. And then if you have a long panel, you'll also have them located mid-span. So the structure of the building needs to have a place where those tieback connections can um, actually connect or tie back to the building. Um, this just shows you again um, in, a, in a building where are all the connections going to be uh, for it. You've got your, your cast in place um, slab on grade in the bottom and then you've got um, wall panels and then if you look kind of behind it you can see where all of the connections are um, with your uh, gravity connectors, your mid-span connectors, your floor connectors and that's on a steel um, piece and there it is again you can see all of the framing this is with steel framing um, then if you've got like a wall panel um, you're also going to have it connect back. A lot of times you'll have um, some kind of uh, shim or some kind of um, composite material that uh, the connections are actually going to rest on so you don't have steel resting on um, steel. Um, the weld plates are going to be cast right into the um, precast panels and so the precaster was going to have uh, working drawings in the plant that really shows the guys where all of the steel needs to go, where those connection panels go, and then you can connect it to a steel building, a cast-in-place building, or a precast building, and those other, the, the, uh, the uh, partners to those steel plates or the connection plates have to be ready on the building where, where you need them. Just another panel to beam connection system where you've got the um, panels, or the, sorry, the pieces embedded right into the precast and then bolted on. Then sometimes you'll also have a panel to panel connection to keep there from being too much movement um, in between the, the panels and those are usually done with a threaded insert. Um, typically, you are going to have a joint in between the panels that will be caulked on those wall panel projects with uh, either a single line or double line of caulk. Um, that um, is something that a precaster can give you advice on, but it's not always part of the precaster's um, contract to caulk those joints. That is going to be a maintenance issue, so 20 years down the line, 15 years down the line, <laughs> they will have to be re-caulked to uh, keep the seal. Usually you're looking at about a half inch to three quarters inch of uh, space in between those panels. I don't spend a whole lot of time on the um, connection um, issues because the precaster is the one who's going to create all of the connection details. He's going to actually engineer his own product. He's not going to engineer the whole building. Um, he'll need to know the loads, he'll need to know the codes from the local um, area, and uh, he'll create all of the, the connections for um, his own product. Some things to keep in mind with fabrication, delivery, and installation. Just a, just a little bit on that. First of all, how do you make precast affordable? How, what's going to happen? There's, two things that I talk about that really make the biggest difference. There's other little things that you can do as well, but there's only two things that really, really matter when you're talking about the cost of precast, um, whether it be panels or bridge beams or anything. 
First of all, you want to have as much repetition as possible. And that's because of the manufacturing process. You want to be able to have multiple pieces all on that same long line bed. You want to have the same crane be able to pick them up. You want to be able to use the same drawings and engineer each piece so you're not re-engineering each piece separately. So a lot of repetition really is going to help keep the cost down. The second thing is the piece size. Do you think precast pieces should be bigger or smaller? Bigger, exactly. You, um, you want to have them be bigger because bigger will be less expensive. You want to um, have fewer time with the crane. The, you want to have the crane pick up fewer pieces of precast. That being said, you still need to be able to get the precast to the job. And as we talked about before, concrete is heavy. So there are going to be some limitations on the, the size. Um, you'll also have limitations with um, just trucking it to the job site. Um, in general, a wall panel is going to be limited by about 12 and a half feet in one direction. Um, in the other direction, you'll typically see about um, 20 to 30 feet long. And that's going to be something that they don't need any special permitting. It's pretty easy to get it to the job site that way. If you start getting bigger pieces than that, you have issues with the precaster ha having to have cranes in his yard that are big enough to pick up the pieces. You'll have to have um, special permitting to get it on the highway. So there will be issues that will um, come around with that. Just as we're talking about the uh, repetition, um, especially when you're talking about architectural precasts, they're building all of the form work. So you want to be able to use those forms as many times as possible. Um, you can build repetition in a lot of different ways. Sometimes you have funny looking pieces because of that. But in general, also rectangular pieces of precast are going to be a lot easier to hang on a building than pieces like, like this. Panel size. Um, in general, like we said, bigger is going to be better or less expensive. Um, one of the things that um, you do need to keep in mind with the, the panel size is uh, the pick price. Um, and that's one of the reasons that you want it to be larger. Every time a crane picks up a piece of precast on the job site and puts it on the building, the contractor is going to pay a pick price. And in downtown Chicago right now, that ranges in about the $1,500 uh, per piece range. So if you have a 1 by 10 foot column cover, that's still going to cost you $1,500. It'll cost you the same $1,500 if you have a uh, 12 foot by 30 foot piece of wall panel. So if you start looking at the square footage cost <coughs> of putting it on the building, bigger will be less expensive. There you are getting it to the job site. It's kind of unusual to have two pieces of precast, but because they have those big punched out windows in this case, they could do it with the weight of the concrete. Sometimes too you're going to see some larger pieces. It is possible to do one of a kind or larger pieces on a, onto a job site, but then there will be special <laughs> issues that you need to take into consideration. In this case, they they're tilting it on its side. Um, one of the things that we've seen in this part of the country is a, uh, a uh, 15 foot wide double T, which is new. Most of the double T's that uh, you see around the country are 12 feet wide. So 15 foot wide, that's a little bit wider, and they are shipping those also on an angle as well. In an ideal world, this is what a precast job site would look like, except that it would be a precast structure in the back instead of a steel structure. But it's got this nice flat surface. It's got the crane right up next to the building. You can see the truck with the precast on it can pull up right next to the crane. And uh, you pick up the crane and have this nice plumb line between the crane and the building. And it goes on pretty simply. So in an ideal world, that's what it would look like. In the real world, uh, a lot of times they look more like this. You, know, you might have issues with 
uh, you've got water right next to the site or electrical wires or it's muddy and the crane is sinking into the mud. So there's all sorts of issues that have to be taken care of before you get that, that nice crane picking up the precast off the truck and, and putting it on the site. So um, real world versus you know your ideal world. Um, hoisting early, um, a lot of times when you're hoisting concrete you do want to either think about um, starting at the back of the site and moving forward. Sometimes you can move around or move from the um, inside of, of the building out. What The things that you want to avoid are um, double handling. You don't want to have to use two cranes to pick up a piece or pick it up twice. Um, you want to avoid coming underneath something else with the precast because you're asking to just ding or chip it. Um, precast is actually pretty fragile. You wouldn't expect concrete to be fragile, but with the pre-stressing, um, you have to be very careful about how you're going to pick it up. You're never going to pick up a long beam from the center of it. It would just snap right in half. So you're always going to have to pick up the beam from the, the four corners. Um, this is, uh, we talked earlier about Soldier Field, just to give you an idea of what the erection issues were at Soldier Field building that bowl. There they are erecting um, from the inside, and you can really see that it was pretty tight site. Yeah. Um, they had, where is it? I think it's right here. They had a piece that er everything came in through this one piece of the, um, one piece of the stadium. I think it was there. And they might have disassembled them before they brought them out. It's been about three years since I sat through a presentation on this. Yeah. Usually, um, in this part of the country, the precast is usually part of the precaster's contract, and so they don't usually use helicopters or anything like that. Now, I did have a um, precaster up in Milwaukee. Have you ever been up there and seen the river walk that they've built up there that kind of comes out on the river? That uses all double T's, and that was actually an FOB. They just took the precast to the site and dropped it at the river bank, and then they had a barge that came in and they barged it out to the site and placed it in, but the, the precaster didn't want anything to do with it. He just didn't feel like he knew enough about barges and water to, to get that erection. So that was a specialty erector. But I've never heard of anybody using uh, helicopters for it. So We talked about this earlier, but I always like to just mention it again, that PCI certification <laughs> It's your good housekeeping <laughs> seal of approval on your precast, and um, it is something that uh, you know to always look for when you're talking about who's going to actually do the precast on a job. Just to finish up, I thought <clears throat> I'd talk a little bit about what kinds of precast products are out there, what kinds of projects are our members working on. Um, we really are going to be in just about every market that's out there. So um, the commercial, specialized, industrial, transportation, and housing are the, the ones that we see a lot of. Commercial, everything from retail stores to um, uh, office buildings, a lot of mixed use, a lot of parking decks are being done in that area. We're seeing quite a number of stadiums now um, that are using precast concrete, whether it be for the decorative uses or for um, the actual structure, all of the, the um, risers, the vomitories, things like that. Um, industrial manufacturing, you can, if you've got anything that requires USDA um, finishes on it, which are very smooth, you can't have a lot of bug holes or um, places for um, uh, food particles to, or bacteria to get in. Um, we see a lot of precast used in those areas because of the quality control that you can get up front. Transportation, um, sound walls are an area that we haven't talked much about, but um, that's, a, and you don't see too much of them down here, but up closer to the city where there's more housing near the highways, you will see a lot of precast sound walls being used as well as all the bridges that we've talked about. Um, this is an unusual part of the country that we actually have some single family homes being built out of precast. 
Um, there's one of our members does these um, these homes in the city of Chicago that are scattered site low income housing, and uh, it basically is using eight pieces of precast, and it goes up in a day, so uh, pretty pretty fast. Why would an owner want to use precast? Well, one of the biggest things is the speed of construction. Um, you can put a Walmart up in a week. You can put an apartment up in 80 days of uh, construction. Basically, if you're using um, wall panels, for instance, a precast director can put up in one day what a mason would take about two weeks to put up. So um, you can really, really move pretty quickly with precast. The long clear spans, the 60 feet for um, parking decks and uh, hollow core can get 30 to 50 feet long so you can get some nice spans. Fire resistance is a big issue. Um, everything that goes into concrete is uh, resistant to fire except the steel. So what you want to do is have good coverage of your steel. You want to usually have about two inches of coverage and that's going to give you fire ratings very easily, two hours of fire ratings and you can go up from there. Acoustical control, we're seeing a lot of requests for this, especially where there's an airport nearby or train tracks or something else. Concrete has a, a nice ability to um, bounce sound away from the, from the building. We are seeing a lot of our members getting involved in uh, LEED certified projects where sustainability is an issue. They want to have energy conservation. Um, sometimes the precaster, one of the precasters was just telling me this week they're doing a project for a, a food processing plant near Beloit, uh, Wisconsin, and they're having to bring all of their waste um, from the hollow core to the job site so they can measure how much wa construction waste is on the, the project for the lead certification. So, you know, precasters are willing to work with you if you have um, energy conservation or sustainability issues. Low maintenance, you're not going to have to tuck point it, you're not going to have to paint architectural precast, and so you can really get something that's uh, pretty simple maintenance. Things that are going to add maintenance, um, I was just talking to an architect last week who added a graffiti coating to, uh, to a uh, university project that they were doing. So, um, you know, if you've got special coatings like that, that will be a maintenance issue. Um, you will have to come back and caulk it, and that's usually a maintenance issue every 15 to 20 years, depending on um, the weather and exposure to the weather that you're in. And I think the best, um, the best benefit to member or to your customers is the attractive appearance that you can really create something that speaks to them, that, that you, you're giving them what they want as far, far as the color and texture. Um, some resources for you, you can go to our website, which is pci-iw.org, and um, I've got uh, some projects on there that you can look at. I've got a list of our member companies. I've also given you all a list of our member companies in the newsletter and the, the map that I had. Yeah? Did you say uh, .iw or slash? It was dash iw, pci-iw.org. And then the, the national group is pci.org, which, which you've got up here. So um, on the PCI website, um, they've got uh, something called the Designer's Knowledge Bank. And it's got a lot of full text articles. If you want the Holocore manual, you can find it online. If you want um, an article on sustainability using precast, you can find it online. And they've got that uh, right there so you can do it without going to the library, without ever leaving your desk. You can find all of that information right, right at our website. And that's who I am again, and I'd be happy to stick around and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Any questions for Mark? Yeah. What do you think are the biggest advances in precast since like, the big boom of the 60s? Well, there's a couple things. One is just the spans that they're able to get with the product. Um, the double T's now that they can, get, you know, use more durable concrete and high-strength concrete. They're spanning parking decks 60 feet 
that's typical, but they're even going longer to you know get in that hundred foot span with it, and with the larger uh, pieces of uh, you know fifteen foot wide, so they can use even fewer pieces and it can go up even faster. Um, they're also using that self compacting concrete, and that's really um, for some of our members revolutionized the way that they're manufacturing. That's been a really a big benefit to them. Um, Hollow core also has much longer spans than it used to. It's got deeper sections and, and longer spans. So I think too, for the, the architects would probably tell you the sculptural um, abilities of the product and how precasters have kind of stepped up to the plate and been able to you know, make it look like limestone if they want it to look like limestone, make it look like concrete if they want it to look like, you know, they have that organic look of, of concrete to it. So I think that's, that's really come a long way too. Thank you.